Steve Biggs here today talking about wow crops. Growing edibles is fun. These are crops that will make people say, wow, that's neat, that's fun, that's beautiful. Lots of ideas for wow crops. Edible gardening should be lots of fun. Welcome to Richter's Seminars. This video presentation is from a series of free educational seminars on herb and garden topics offered each year at Richter's. I had a great message on the phone a couple years ago. I came home to this voicemail that was just, as a gardener, it made me feel so happy. And it went something like this. Mr. Biggs, you don't know me, but I know you. And of course that had me wondering, who is this? And the message went on to say, I walk my dog past your house every day, and I must know the name of that Promethean plant in your front yard. So I was happy about this message because as a gardener it's always nice when somebody takes an interest in what we do. And uh, as a writer I was happy to learn about a new word because I had no idea what Promethean meant, so bold and daring. And uh, this Promethean plant that my neighbor had taken notice of is a vegetable and and there's a little story about how this particular vegetable ended up in my front yard because there was a vacant lot in my neighborhood in North York and in, in Toronto and the local councillor got together with a few neighbors and the idea was let's take this vacant lot that's overgrown and let's make a community vegetable garden so I went to one of these meetings that he was holding and it, it was a neat idea but I came home from one of those meetings feeling a bit dismayed because a couple neighbors were upset about this idea. They were upset because they didn't want to see vegetables. They wanted a fence or they didn't want vegetables there at all. I thought that was really absurd. So I came home and I was thinking, well, I'm a writer. Maybe I should write an article about this. And then I thought, wait, I'll take out my front lawn and I'll put vegetables in my front lawn. And uh, so... I was toying with this idea and I was a little bit nervous because where I am in North York, it's, it's got that semi-suburban feel. There's lots of grass, there's lots of driveway and lots of shrubs and certainly not a lot of vegetables in front of the houses. And we were pretty new to the neighborhood. I was a bit worried about what my neighbors would think. And I was humming and hawing about this idea of taking out my front lawn and my wife Shelley finally she put her her hand on my shoulder and she said Steve you know I think they know you're eccentric why don't you just make your vegetable garden out front and so that's how this Promethean plant ended up in my front yard and I'll show you what that uh, front yard garden started out as so here what we're looking at is me just starting to peel back the grass in that front yard and I've put a little bit of split rail fence up so it, it looked a little bit nicer and I've put a couple big rocks in there. But at this point I was very nervous about what the neighbors would think. But this is what we had at the end of the year. This is the front yard that had been all grass and at this point it's completely filled in. So we had the giant sunflowers at the front with the edible seeds, we had hot peppers, we had different squash, we had tomatoes. And it, it looked very nice, so I accomplished my goal of having an attractive garden full of edibles. And one of the big benefits was that I met so many neighbors. So people that I hadn't met up to that point would be walking past and they'd see me gardening and they'd stop to chat. And it was really interesting for me how gardening has that strong social aspect to it too. So it really engendered a lot of conversations and, and it was just a lot of fun. So... I hope that I inspire some of you today to go home and grow some wow crops and I hope maybe some of you might try them in your your front yards too. Does anybody here have a front yard vegetable garden? One? Two? Okay. Good. I love to hear it. Okay. I like to introduce my kids when I give a talk. They're the reason I'm out doing garden talks. And when we had kids, my wife liked her job better than I liked mine. So I stayed home to look after the kids and I started doing garden writing and garden speaking. So I always like to give them credit when I give a talk. So it's Emma, uh, Quinn, Emma and Keaton and they're helping me shell lima beans here. 
They love to help in the veggie garden and we have a lot of fun. Here they are, I believe, in child labor. And here are the two boys. I was putting in some new concrete curbs in the backyard last year. And so they got the Tonka trucks out and they were helping me move all the aggregate around the yard for my new curbs. And my little guy, Keaton, he loves bugs. So here he is with uh, his collection of snails on the way home from school one day. The middle guy hates bugs, but the little guy just loves them. And here they are, we're doing some seeding together, so helping me plant some seeds. And, and where I garden, so I told you I garden in North York, which is semi-suburban, but I have a nice patch in the ground, but I also grow in containers. And for a long time, I always thought of container gardening as second fiddle to gardening in the ground. But I have a flat portion on my garage roof where I've been putting big containers, and it's proven to be great for all those heat-loving crops. So if any of you are gardening in small spaces, I hope to leave you with the idea that containers can be great. All those heat-loving crops, okra, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, amazing. In fact, they do so well in the containers that I tend not to put many of those in the garden anymore because there's such a big advantage to a container for those crops. Now, I have a picture of my book, No Guff Vegetable Gardening, here, and this whole idea about wow crops. Today I'm telling you about wow crops for your garden. It's an idea that my co-author Donna and I came up with. And when we, when we put together this book, our hope was to make vegetable gardening fun because we've seen a lot of very good books, but they're, sometimes they're very serious. And we've seen some people scared away from gardening. So our hope was to make vegetable gardening fun. And so it's an illustrated book, it's colorful, and when it comes to picking crops for the garden, we want to take the same approach. So we have some wow crops in the book, and I've taken those and I've added some more of what I consider wow crops. What is a wow crop? It's a completely arbitrary thing, a wow crop, but it's something that's, that's fun and something that makes gardening worthwhile, and especially if you don't have time to put in a huge garden or you don't have a lot of space, Pick something that's fun and that's worthwhile. So today I'll share with you my ideas that fit that bill. And when I'm thinking about the wow crops, I break it down three ways. So I have what I call the attention grabber wow crops. These are things that when you serve them on a plate to your company, your company will say, wow, that's neat. I haven't seen that before. I also like to talk about high reward wow crops. And these are things that if you have that small garden and you don't know what to plant, these are things that I'll say, plant this. If you don't have a lot of space, this is worthwhile. Very worthwhile. And then I'll finish off with a couple of plants, including that Promethean plant, that even if you don't want to eat anything from your garden, they have a very nice ornamental appeal. So these are things that are worth growing, if nothing else, at least for their ornamental value. And we'll start off with the humble bean. This is my first wow crop. And this is a pole bean, this particular one, called purple peacock. And if you're wondering why would I start out with a bean, this bean is wonderful on a vegetable platter. So first of all, of course, the color. So I'm a sucker for color. Vegetables with neat colors I think are well worthwhile. The thing that's nice about this, if, if you look at that bean, it's wider. These, these pole beans, they're wider than a lot of the wax beans that we get at the supermarket. So you put something like that on a vegetable platter as a fresh vegetable, imagine how much dip you can pick up with a bean like that. Because a bean is really a vehicle for getting dip from the platter to your mouth. So it's great in that regard. Now, if you haven't used purple beans before, one thing to know is that when you cook these, they turn green. And so with them, I recommend serving them on a platter, fresh. I think that's where they have the most punch. And here we are. You can see the beans on the platter. Some, and uh, purple beans aren't the only types of pole beans. There are lots. Uh, you can get yellow ones, green ones. And there's also one I like. Um, you're looking here at one called rattlesnake. And this is one that's a green bean and it has these nice little red marks on it. A very attractive bean. Rattlesnake. Carrots. 
And again with carrots, I'm recommending you get that wow factor by growing carrots that are different from what you might get at the supermarket every day. So here's a picture with some, uh, some darker carrots and some yellow carrots. There's lots of variety out there. There's, there's a lot more available than there used to be. This was one I saw at the Royal Winter Fair, by the way, last year. I think it was 10 pounds, uh, a big, big knobby carrot. This is one called Purple Haze. And what I like about this variety is it looks pretty purpley on the outside, but when you cut into it, when you cut across it, there's some orange inside. So it, it's quite beautiful when you cut this one into medallions, you have orange and purple together, and it looks very attractive. This is one called Deep Purple, and this is the, I think, the, the darkest carrot that I've seen. I was at a market garden, and uh, a, a beautiful carrot. It has that almost reddish color to it, Deep Purple. Quiz time. Who knows what causes a carrot to become hairy like this? Anybody have an idea? Moisture. Actually, it's not moisture. And what, what we're looking at here is um, too rich a soil. I had a low spot in the garden and I brought in a lot of triple mix to, to level it out. Very rich. And this is what you get if you grow carrots in a soil that is, that is too rich. That sheep-like carrot. Now dahlias. So here's another wow crop for you. And I was touring a market garden and uh, the market gardener had a patch of dahlias. And I said, David, are you, are you selling cut flowers now? And he said, no. He said, I'm selling dahlia tubers to high-end restaurants. And the restaurants were using these as a water chestnut substitute. And David, the market gardener, had been a chef himself. So he proceeded to describe to me the flavor of these uh, dahlia tubers. And I, he used words like the, it had the brightness of ginger with the earthiness of celery root. And I thought I was the only garden speaker going around talking about eating dahlia roots until I was at a, an event one day and uh, right before me was Marjorie Mason from Mason House Gardens nearby and she talked about making dahlia bread where she grates up the dahlia tubers and instead of putting zucchini, grated zucchini in as in a zucchini bread, she makes a dahlia bread with grated dahlia tubers. Fennel. Another wow crop for you. Now we're looking here at Florence fennel and it's, it's nice, but this isn't what I'm really getting at. By the way, on a field scale, this is what fennel looks like. I love that ferny foliage. But with fennel, for me, the wow comes from the flowers. And again, I was at that same market garden and David, the market gardener, had these fennel flowers and I said are you pulling those out soon because they're past their prime he said no it's the flowers that I'm selling to the restaurants and the restaurant the cooks the chefs would take the fennel flowers use them as garnishes but what else they did was they take the flowers and tap them over a white plate and you get that nice yellow pollen around the edge of the plate and I thought what a great idea now, if you are looking for a fennel to grow in the garden, you can grow that Florence fennel that I showed you, but there's also a perennial called bronze fennel. It doesn't form that same bulb like the Florence fennel, but this is a very nice looking perennial, and the, um, the leaves are also a nice garnish. And I noticed that Richter's has the bronze fennel, so I'll pass around some of the seeds, but it's a, it's a nice perennial to grow. ground cherries and Cape gooseberries. For me, these are a definite wow crop and for my kids, for certain, they gobble up as many as I can grow. Now, there's a husk, this papery husk, and inside of it is a small fruit, a yellowy orange color. Uh, I was traveling once in the Lac Saint-Jean region of Quebec and they had these little bottles of this bright, vibrant yellow liqueur, and they were making that out of ground cherries, and it had a beautiful, tangy taste. So, but you can grow these in the garden. They're not hard to grow. Ground cherries, Cape gooseberries, they're related, so they both have the papery husk and the fruit, but there is a difference, so let me tell you about the two. So, the one that grows most quickly is the ground cherry. 
and it's ready earlier in the season. Now the Cape Gooseberry, which sometimes you'll see in the grocery store, sold as Cape Gooseberries or Physilis is the other name that's on them sometimes. They're a little bit bigger and in my mind they have a nicer flavor. But the thing is they take longer to mature. So very often in my garden it's late August and September before these are ready. So I tend to grow the two. The ground cherries are ready earlier and the Cape Gooseberries are ready a little bit later. And here we are looking at some growing on the plant. And uh, in this case, the, the Cape Gooseberry plant can be quite tall. And so I use a tomato cage or some sort of structure that, that holds it up. Now this is what I passed seeds out for before the talk. These are called Mexican sour gherkins. They're also called mouse melons. They're about the size of your fingernail. And they do look like little melons. They grow like cucumbers, so they're, they're quite easy to grow. It's a vining plant, and it's really something that you never see for sale at the green grocer or in the grocery store. And yet these are easy to grow, very, very easy to grow. We, we eat them fresh, and, uh, but one year I had so many that I wasn't sure what to do with them all, so I put them all into a pail with some brine and garlic, and I pickled them, just making a, a traditional style pickle, and they pickled beautifully. So they're quite versatile. Some people also use them in stir fries. This is what they look like growing. So you can see there's a, this is a little tendril here, like a cucumber plant has tendrils where it will grab on to, uh, to a fence or to some kind of structure. So these will grow in the same way. If you have a chain link fence or chicken, chicken wire, they grow right up it. And here it is, uh, I'm showing you a, a mouse melon that's well into the flower patch because this particular one had vined through and, and so they really can uh, weave through all the different plants. Very easy to grow, very, very rewarding. Now here's uh, Emma helping me can tomatoes. Emma's my daughter. And we like growing red tomatoes and, and canning tomatoes. But if we're talking about wow crops, I say to people, grow something that's different because tomatoes are quite wonderful in the fact that there are so many different varieties. And so we try to grow lots of different colors and sizes and shapes. Here we are, we have some on the split rail fence. Now this though is one of my favorite wow crops. And you're looking at a tomato here that I just, I call it Dino's Winter Tomato. And it's from a seed that my dad's friend Dino got from his parents and someone in his family at one point had brought this from Italy. It's not the reddest tomato, not the nicest looking tomato. In fact, it's not the nicest tasting tomato. But this thing keeps. I picked them all in October before that last frost put them in the cold room and I have fresh tomatoes that I can use until they run out usually in the winter January February even into March I've had these so it's a thick skinned tomato and it keeps beautifully and when we're talking about a crop that has a great wow factor what can be more wowing than serving your guests a bruschetta or some type of tomato preparation in the middle of winter and saying by the way that's from fresh tomatoes from my garden it's it's really a wonderful thing so this is the winter tomato. And this is the winter tomato again. I think this is a little bit earlier in the season, so they're looking a little bit plumper. They haven't shriveled at this point. But there are lots of other nice tomatoes too. So this is one we like called speckled Roman. And you can see it has a shape uh, like one of the Roma type tomatoes with that, those yellow uh, striations on it. This was one called white currant that I wasn't crazy about, but my kids liked it because it's a it's kid scale, a small cherry type tomato. This one, I have no idea what the name is. I was at a seed trial and I was snapping pictures and I've kicked myself ever since for not writing down the name of this beautiful tomato. But I show it just to, to stress the point that there is a lot of variety with tomatoes. So if you have a limited space, grow something different. This one, green zebra, and it's a tomato about this size. 
green with yellow. And I don't find this one is actually the most flavorful tomato. I like something that's more zingy. This one doesn't have a lot of zing, I'll call it. But this is a beautiful one if you have it in a basket of tomatoes to give to a friend. You mix this in with one of the speckled Romans and a couple of red ones and it makes a very beautiful, beautiful presentation. This I show this picture and these are just tomatoes that have grown in the garden on their own. The year after where I uh, had grown tomatoes the year previously, you get all those little tomato seedlings coming up. And I show this picture because sometimes people have the impression that tomatoes are difficult plants to grow. And uh, nothing can be further from the truth because they really are vigorous and, and weedy sometimes. But one thing that helps me out a lot is I, I put collars around my young tomato transplants. Does anybody here have cutworm problems? Yes, okay. So I see somebody nodding. And if you don't know cutworms, they're, they're little worm-like insects that come out in the night. You don't usually see them in action. And they, they, they bite off your little seedlings that you've just worked for weeks to grow big enough to plant into the garden. And they bite them off and you come out in the morning and you see all these little plants toppled over as if a little lumberjack had come in there and hacked them down. So all you have to do to, uh, to beat the cutworms is to have sort of, uh, some sort of physical barrier around the stem of your tomato. So this newspaper collar achieves that. You're just taking a little strip of newspaper, you wrap it around that plant as you're putting it into the ground and that keeps away the cutworms. And by the time that newspaper uh, decomposes, the plant is big enough that the cutworm isn't an issue. Here I'm uh, showing a picture of a staked tomato. And my dad always said, you must stake your tomatoes. That's the only way to grow them properly. You must stake them. You must pinch out the suckers. And that's how I always grew tomatoes. And then wh when we had kids, I found I didn't have time to go in there and tie all the tomato plants. So I started putting cages on the plants because I figured that would be less work. What I found though is that a lot of the cages that are for sale, they're about knee high. And a, a tomato plant takes something that's much bigger. And what's worked for me is I go by the four foot by eight foot sheets of that wire mesh that's used in concrete. And then I'll cut that in two and make a couple big four foot high cages. And that works nicely. Those are a lot bigger and a lot sturdier than some of the commercially available cages. And I show this just to let people know that I do have squirrels too, like everybody else. This was the first tomato that I was eyeing up one year. It was going to be the first ripe tomato of the year. So I'd gone to work that morning thinking I'll pick that tomato when I come home today. And I came home and here it was on the patio outside my window and what was really frustrating was that the patio was about 40 feet away from the garden so it was almost as if the squirrel had eaten part of the tomato and then walked 40 feet to put it somewhere where I, where I would see it. Infuriating. Okra. Uh, another wow crop for me is the purple okra and uh, Richter's has seeds of uh, burgundy okra that I uh, found. I was giving a talk at a senior's home one day and I started talking about okra and there was a big collective sigh in the audience and I thought oh I wonder what did I just do and it turns out somebody came up to me after the talk and they said sorry about that our chef prepared okra for the first time last night and it was absolutely revolting uh, and okra is one of those things that if you don't know how to prepare it, it it's not nice but I'm a big fan of this burgundy okra not only is the pod attractive, but the plant itself is beautiful. Um, these are, by the way, what the, the flowers look like. If you haven't seen okra flowers, they look like hibiscus flowers. They're short-lived, so you don't always catch them when they're open, but really stunning. And, and here's the plant. Beautiful red stems, and then the leaves have that nice red veining. So the part that we eat is very nice, but it's also just a beautiful plant to have in the garden. So those were some of my attention-grabbing wow crops. We'll move on to what I call the high reward crops. And these are things that if you have a small space, this is what I would say to start out growing. And 
I'm a writer because I'm not really a mathematical person. So what you're looking at now is probably the only equation you'll get from me. A uh, high reward crop is easy to grow and it's not that common. Those are the, the two things that I have in mind as I'm picking these. And here's my first one, which we have plants of. Does anybody know this? Sorrel, yeah. And as you pass that around, you can take a little corner of a leaf and nibble on it. If you haven't tasted sorrel before, it's sour, not unpleasantly sour. And in terms of being a high reward plant for the garden, it's easy to grow because it's a perennial. So this thing comes back year after year. It's not something that you always need to replant. And I've very rarely seen sorrel for sale in the supermarket. It, it's hard to find, surprisingly, even though it's so easy to grow. Now, Richter's also has, uh, I was passing around the garden sorrel, they have a variety called profusion, where the leaves get a lot bigger. Uh, it's quite a beautiful plant. So sorrel, in the kitchen, you can think of sorrel as a lemon substitute for northerners. And uh, we can't grow lemons here too easily, but sorrel grows well. And when you cook with sorrel, those leaves actually just disintegrate. So if you're making a sorrel soup and you put the leaves in, they just, they melt they melt away. Some people will make a sauce for meat or fish with sorrel and it's very nice. And I, I made a sorrel vichy soise, uh, a cream of leek and potato soup with sorrel in it. And beautiful. Really, a really nice vegetable. Question? Yes? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a good comment. So the profusion sorrel and their chives too, they don't go to seed. And um, it's interesting that you mention the seeds because sorrel, if you get the Weed Guide to Ontario, so this is a book that's put out by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture. Sorrel is actually in this book, although I've never found it to be at all weedy in the garden. I have a clump that just stays there. The, the little seeds have never caused it to spread. So even though it's in that book, I'm telling you, don't be worried about it being a weedy plant. And um, I have found sorrel for sale now. Just over the last year, there are a lot of Russian and Ukrainian stores where I live. And so I found uh, canned sorrel and brine. And then I noticed that the Longo supermarket is starting to sell fresh sorrel in the, in the herb section. So it is, uh, there is more of an awareness, but it is very much, for me, a high reward wow crop. Now, Swiss chard. If I was to recommend to people to grow just one green, it would be Swiss chard. If you grow lettuce, you know that partway through the season, you have this nice looking crop of lettuce, then all of a sudden you get a blast of heat and it all goes to seed. And same thing with spinach and a lot of the greens. So Swiss chard is a different beast because it has a two-year life cycle. And what that means is that the first year, all it wants to do is make leaves. It does not want to go to seed. And so it just keeps kicking out more leaves, more leaves, and more leaves. And you can keep cutting it back, and it will keep growing. So very much uh, a high-reward plant. You're looking at one of those rainbow-type mixes with all the different colors, highly ornamental. I've used this in planters, in ornamental planters, and it looks gorgeous. And... Um, I noticed that there's a rainbow chard mix and also a ruby chard that Richter's has. Easy to grow. This is a plant that I cooked on television once. So there's my claim to uh, Swiss chard fame. I had a TV show contact me and say, can you come in and talk about growing vegetables? And it was November and I said, well, guys, you know, it's November. Why don't I come in and talk about cooking things that some people might not know how to grow? And so I, I had lots of beautiful Swiss chard in the garden and I took in some Swiss chard. I took in some of that sorrel and then I took in some leeks and we cooked that up into a spanakopita type pastry. You know those, uh, the phyllo pastry that's often filled with spinach. Well, I said, well, let's use Swiss chard and leeks and sorrel and set instead. And it was beautiful, beautiful. And I didn't lose a finger in the process. I was worried going on TV that I'd, I'd be a little bit shaky and nervous and, and cut myself. But I came out of it unscathed. 
Now, another nice thing about Swiss chard, we're looking at Swiss chard here that's been painted by some frost. And you can see that it looks very nice still, even when there's a frost. Uh, this plant stands up, you can keep harvesting it, and it keep, if you're growing it as an ornamental, it keeps looking quite nice. And it's easy to grow. So I, I have what I call the scatter and poke seeding method for Swiss chard, which works for beets too. The, the seed size is about the same. It's a bigger seed. And if you're not a perfectionist and you're not bothered by things that aren't in perfectly straight rows, then what you can do is scatter those seeds and then you, you see them on the ground because they're big enough and then you can just poke them all into the ground. So it's a very easy way to, to grow it. And certainly it's kid friendly too. My kids love doing that. I'll scatter the seeds and then they'll run around the garden and I'll hear them saying poke, 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 poke. Now, currants. This is a very high reward crop. Uh, we're looking at red currants. And red currants, it's funny, they grow so well here in southern Ontario and yet you almost never see them for sale unless you go to a farmer's market. These things will take those less than perfect conditions that we have in our gardens. They don't mind crummy soil, uh, they tolerate that partial shade and they bear well. I had a neighbor who had a red currant bush growing in the shade of an apple tree and it had been there for years, never pruned anything, but it kept producing lots of currants every year and I know because I'd always reach through the fence and pick them when my neighbor Anna didn't. So you know, it's a very easy to grow crop, very worthwhile. And then there's the cousin to the currant which is the gooseberry. And again, the gooseberry is very easy to grow but very difficult to find in the store. Now, some people will say, so besides making jelly, what can you do with these things? So what I like to do is I make juice. And uh, I don't do, in the summer I just freeze them because we're busy. So I put them on a cookie sheet, freeze them, they go into milk bags and into the freezer. And then over the course of the winter I take them out, thaw them out and I make juice. child labor. I told you I like child labor. I was thinking the kids would be discouraged picking the gooseberries because those bushes do have little thorns on, but they did quite well. And here's Keaton with the, the stash. I think about half of those made it to the kitchen. The rest went into the kids' tummies. Now, uh, this is black currants we're looking at, so another current family member that's very worthwhile growing. And people say to me, but it's so much work to get the stems off of the currants. So I'll jokingly say, well, child labor. But on a more serious note, I told you how I freeze the currants. And when you take those out of the freezer and those stems are still frozen, they're brittle. And so what you can do is you pour them back onto a cookie sheet and you just rub your hands back and forth over the frozen currants and those stems, most of them will break off. And it's a lot easier than trying to pick off the stems before you freeze them. I was at the Montreal Botanical Gardens last year and they had their currants growing in the shade of some fruit trees. And so I took this picture because it drives home the point that these bushes will really tolerate less than perfect conditions. And then down the street from me I spotted, I don't know if this is a currant or a gooseberry growing in the crotch of a tree, but I guess a bird had deposited the seed and there it is growing in the crotch of a tree. Good question. So are they still considered a threat to pine? And for those of you who don't know, there's a, a rust disease and the, uh, that affects pines and the, the current is an alternate host. So uh, yes, they can be a threat. There are resistant varieties. So if you're in an area with a lot of pines, uh, there's a certain number of feet that you should uh, have your currants or gooseberries away from a stand of pines. I can't remember what it is, uh, but I can look that up and tell you if you email me. Um, but there are resistant varieties, so that would be the way to go. Yes? Are the gooseberries different from Cape Gooseberry? Yes, they are. They're completely different. Um, but that makes me think of something else to mention that with gooseberries there are green gooseberries, there are 
purple gooseberries. So some of them will turn a red or a purple color. And and yellow, thank you. And sometimes people, even with a red gooseberry, will pick them green because some people prefer that green gooseberry, that real sour taste. So um, the color they are when you pick them is dictated by the variety and then a case of preference as well. I like them very green and hard and sour. No, I'm talking about the gooseberry bush now. Yeah. Garlic. We're talking about high reward wow crops still. So what is special about garlic? I think it's one of the few vegetables that a home gardener can grow and in a small plot grow enough for the whole household for a year because you can grow quite a bit of garlic in a small space and the great thing about garlic is that it stores well. So if you have a decent cold room or cold cupboard, you can store that garlic right up until next year's harvest. And so garlic is one of those things that we never buy. We always have enough that lasts us to the next harvest. So that's what's special about garlic. Easy to grow. You plant it in the fall. And, um, and for those of you who don't know the scapes, uh, the hardneck garlic that we can grow around here, they have these twisty um, flower-like things called scapes. And these stems, you can cut them off and you can use them in stir fries, you can make pestos. I think for a long time a lot of people discarded them until the fancy restaurants started using them and paying big money for them. Yeah. Good question. So should they be cut off? Yes, you should remove the scapes so that the energy from the plant goes to the bulbs. And if you're planning to consume the scapes, you want to break them off while they're still not woody. So um, if you start trying to break them off and that scape is woody and hard to break off, then it's not going to be very nice to eat. So definitely remove them and remove them in time that you can enjoy them too. Uh, in the back here. Mm -hmm. Good point. So the, the comment is that you can use the garlic leaves as well. That's a great point. How do you use them? Are you using them as a stir fry or? No, I just eat them like fresh, fresh in a green salad. Eating them fresh in a salad. I've never done that, but I love garlic, so I'll be trying that. In Europe, I'm from Bulgaria. Uh -huh. Garlic is used 80% green, fresh, and 20% green. Ah. So eating the green garlic? No, you you rarely see the green garlic for sale. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. At farmers markets, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Last year, I planted potato I cheated potatoes in, in its place. Okay. By the end of October, I harvested the potatoes, and I got about 10 pounds. Oh, so I, I bought a bag of, of seed, seed potatoes in the spring. Mm -hmm. Left them until the end of July, and then planted those in the spring when I harvested the garlic. So for those of you who didn't hear that, and I love this, this idea, of growing potatoes after the garlic is harvested in July, and that's such a great idea using that space for two crops. That's good, thank you. Here we are, so this is the, the dried garlic. I usually hang it under the eaves of the garage to let it cure for a couple weeks. And there are lots of uh, varieties of garlic. I've noticed garlic festivals now, and uh, so there's garlics that are purple skin, red skin, di you know, many different types. So if you become a garlic connoisseur, you can go out there. And I, I was quizzing one of the vendors at one of these festivals, and they were describing all these different garlics with the same love that someone might describe wine and how one was stronger and one was milder. So there's a, a wide, wide variety. And here they are under my garage eaves. And here's Keaton helping me plant the garlic. Okay, my next high reward wow crop is summer squash. And this weird one that we're looking at here, this is a variety called trombetta. 
And what prompted me to grow this was that the Toronto Star Garden columnist Sonia Day had written an article about these trombetta summer squash that she grew. And in the picture, they were almost as, as big as she is tall. And I thought, that looks like a fun crop to grow. So I planted the trombetta summer squash in this front yard veggie patch that I was telling you about. And what happened was, instead of growing where I had planned for them to grow, they grew up the inside of my spruce tree. And so this summer squash that you're looking at now is inside of my spruce tree. And, and here is the bigger summer squash. And you can see now this one hasn't bent over like the other ones because the weight of it being suspended is causing it to grow straight. And so I thought, well, what a great idea to grow squash in a spruce tree and save space. And then I got thinking, well, wait a minute. Years ago, I had a similar experience. This is what I used to look like, by the way. And one year, the, the winter squash uh, took off on me and grew up the cedar hedge at the back of the yard. And in August, the squash often gets powdery mildew on the leaves, and it doesn't look that nice. So I was going back there to rip down these squash vines, and I found, lo and behold, all of these winter squash studded in the cedar hedge. So that's a neat thing about squash. If you get a vining variety and you don't have a lot of space, grow it up a fence or a hedge or a tree. It's, it's a fun way to do things. Do you have to support it? If the, uh, in the case of that big trombetta summer squash you saw, no, I didn't support that. So I would use your judgment if it looks like the plant is bearing the weight. You don't always have to. In the cedar hedge, it was wonderful because the cedar hedge is very dense. And so those squash were sitting in this nice nest of, of cedar branches. But I have seen people doing uh, watermelons and they've certainly supported them with old pantyhose. So I think if you're not sure if it can take the weight, by all means, tie it up. Yeah. This is another summer squash. There's the patty pan type summer squash. They look like little, little spaceships. And I was telling you that there are a lot of uh, Russian grocers near where I live. And I noticed that they'll often take the very small patty pan summer squash and they'll pickle them. And they'll have whole jars of pickled summer squash. So this is a very small one. You can see the little flower on there still. And then as they get bigger, they look like this. Different colors. Oh, there's white ones, green ones. Thank you. Yes, you can eat these raw. So uh, when you let them get very big, they're a little bit um, tougher. But if you get them nice and young and raw, they're nice. So I've put them on a veggie platter when you get the little ones. You eat them raw. Another color. And these are the leaves from that trombetta summer squash that grew up my spruce tree. And I show these just because I was looking at them and I thought, wow, those are very attractive leaves with that nice coloring on there. So they can be very beautiful plants too. So keep in mind, if, you, if, if you're going home thinking about summer squash, there are two different growth habits though. So those patty pan ones that I showed you, those spaceship-like ones, they, most of them tend to have a bush-type habit. So they'll stay in a, in a confined area. Whereas some of the other ones, like that trombetta, they grow as a vine and they'll go far and wide. And the flowers. So usually with summer squash, they produce so much that you're sick of summer squash by the end of the summer. And at that point, you can start eating the flowers too. Uh, so what you can do with these is you can pan fry them or you can deep fry them too. If you put a little bit of batter on them and deep fry them, it makes a nice appetizer. Just get the bees out first before you deep fry them. Okay, so... Those were some ideas for high reward wow crops and we'll finish off with some showy plants. These are things that have a great ornamental value. So even if you don't want to eat them, I recommend them. And here we are. This is the Promethean plant that I started off telling you about. Does anybody know this one? Cardoon, Cardoon thank you. So the, the story about Cardoon is after I grew it in the front yard, it was looking beautiful. And I told my wife, Shelley, 
that I will cook this for you one day. So for about a week I was leading up to the event of cooking these cardoons. And the cardoon, if you don't know, so it's related to the artichoke. With the artichoke you eat the flower bud. With the cardoon you're eating the stalk of the leaf. Not the whole leaf, but just that, that stalk, that, that rib at the back. And uh, so I cooked it up the one day to much fanfare. I'd been leading up to this for about a week. And I served it. I think I made a nice cheese sauce and we put that on top. And we, we both took a bite. And then we looked at each other in horror and spat this out quickly because it was just disgusting. And I, I recounted this story at a talk once. And a guy came up to me after. He said, Steve, I'm a chef. I, I can help you out with your problem with cardoon. So he explained that when you have a plant that has a bitter flavor, like the cardoon does, there are a couple tricks. And he said, first of all, change, if you're boiling it, change the water partway through. So changing the water definitely helped. And he said to salt it too, because that helps to draw out some of the bitterness. So between changing the water and adding some salt, it really made for a much nicer eating experience. But what was the best actually was he then proceeded to tell me, but you know, deep frying is a cure-all for everything. And so another time I took chunks of the cardoon uh, leaf rib and I deep breaded it, deep fried it and served it with a garlic sauce. And that was really good. So the cardoon, um, a lot of people eat it. I've heard it described like being like asparagus or a bit celery-like. I'm not sold on that, but I am sold on the ornamental aspect of it. I think it is just stunning. Uh, these beautiful gray leaves, they'll arch over like this. So here you can see I've planted it along my driveway. This is still fairly early in the summer. By the end of the summer, the plants can be this tall. They're just stunning. Here they are with Emma beside them. And another nice thing, just like the Swiss chard, our cardoon plant holds up nicely in the fall. You get those light frosts and it gets painted with a bit of frost. It wilts just a little, but then on a sunny day it will bounce right back. So it really holds its form and looks just stunning through the fall. And here we are, so we're looking at some frost painted cardoons with some ornamental cabbages in there, and it just looks great. Now, another plant worth growing just for the looks alone, in my opinion, is Malabar spinach. This is a vining plant, and you can eat the stems, and you can eat the leaves, and you'll be using those in a stir-fry. It's a beautiful leaf. It's a, a heart shape, and it has a nice red tint to it with those red stems. Here it is close up, and, and there's these pretty little flower buds that form on there too. So a very, very attractive plant, Malabar spinach. So this was another plant that I had in my front yard along with the cardoons. I was really striving to make this vegetable garden attractive and this plant helped with that. Last summer I was at a rooftop garden in Quebec City. They had a, a fabulous rooftop vegetable garden downtown and they had Malabar spinach growing in big fabric pots on the rooftop. Beautiful. And there are berries too. So the berries add an ornamental appeal. The seeds are on the big side so I, I wouldn't want to be chomping on those but the berries have a nice look. Uh, they add some nice color. Now, we started with a bean today talking about wow crops. I'm going to finish with a bean. Uh, just to drive home the point that these wow crops don't always have to be exotic or unusual. So this is a, a, my favorite runner bean called Painted Lady. And a lot of people know scarlet runner beans where the flowers are just scarlet. Well, this particular one has the scarlet and the white. And I think it's just a stunning ornamental plant. So Painted Lady runner beans. And this is, by the way, is what the seeds look like. And uh, so you can eat those beans when they're green, uh, as a green bean, or you can let them mature into something like that and use it as a dried bean. Now this is how a, a perfectionist would probably grow runner beans. I'm not 
a perfectionist, so my garden never looks this nice and tidy. Uh, I, I made a teepee for my painted lady runner beans, and these uh, runner beans, they jumped from the teepee into my apple tree up above. And so in this picture, we're looking at the, the painted lady flowers mixed in with the green apples, and it was such a nice effect. I was so delighted by this, and I've never been able to recreate it when I've tried to do it on purpose. So, I've given you different ideas for wow crops. Things that look amazing on the plate, things that are very high reward for small spaces, and things that have a great ornamental appeal in the garden. And I hope my goal was to send you home with at least one new idea. So I, I hope I have. As I said, these are inspired by my book, No Guff Vegetable Gardening. Richter sells my book, so I'd like to thank them for supporting me and my book, No Guff Vegetable Gardening. And if you haven't looked through it, feel free to leaf through it. It's at the back. And when it comes to question time, too, I have a book about figs, and they didn't fit into my wow crop talk today. But if you're interested in figs, I'm happy to answer questions about figs as well. So before I take questions, I'll leave you with my contact information. If you go home and you think about a question that you should have asked, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and my website, stephenbiggs.ca, you can email me through that. And at this point, I'm done the formal part of the talk, and if you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Oh, okay. Interesting comment. And that's something I didn't know, that fennel uh, isn't agreeable to all other plants in the vegetable garden. Thank you. And the other part is I tried my sisters last year. Uh-huh. And uh, I figured, you know, the corn stalks would do great with, for the beans, but uh, the raccoons had other thoughts. Ah, like uh, okay. So the three sisters, the corn, beans, and squash together, but the raccoons beat you to the uh, corn. Well, yeah. They yeah. And they ended up killing my beans because they just sort of yeah. The raccoons like the corn where I am too. I don't even try to grow corn anymore for that reason. Yeah. Yes. We had trouble with raccoons uh, for the first time ever. And uh, relatives from out west told us to plant cucumbers. So we planted cucumbers all around the exterior of the corn. We did it in large But anyway, they won't go over, they don't like the prickles of the cucumbers. Oh. So they didn't like the feel of the, the cucumber plant. Interesting. Wow. I had a neighbor who had a problem with the raccoons, and he had an in-ground pool that was always crystal clear. And the raccoons would roll around in his vegetable garden and, and squish everything. And then they'd jump into the pool to clean off, and they'd get the pool all dirty. So he was furious. And he put a single strand of um, electric fence around there. Do you know the same fence that's used for livestock? And he said that solved the problem because the raccoons are smart, and they, they use their paws to touch. So he said that was enough that the raccoons would stay away. Even if you turn the fence off, they associated that with, with the, the zap, and they never bothered him. So I had the idea one year when the, ra the rabbits were marauding in my garden, I put three strands of this <coughs> electric fence. This was before I had kids. I put three strands of it, thinking that that would be enough for the rabbits. And then I was watching the garden one day, and I saw the rabbit go right through the fence. So I went and I tinkered with the transformer. The next day, the same thing. So I thought the fence was dead and I grabbed it and then I jumped about 10 feet in the air because I don't know what it is with rabbits, but they didn't seem to get a jolt. And maybe they need to touch it with their nose or they have too thick a fur. But anyway, electric fence and rabbits doesn't work. Mm -hmm. 
Ja. So the the black mesh Bugs Bunny is the only carrot eating rabbit. Yeah. So if you if anybody didn't hear that, the comment was that the black mesh was enough to keep the rabbits out of the veggie garden. And and I should add that I in the end I put chicken wire around my veggie garden up to about knee height, and that's kept the rabbits out. So for cutworms, the comment is getting the shish kebab sticks, the wooden ones at the dollar store that are inexpensive, and then you can put them on either side of the stem, and that prevents the worm cutting through. Okay. Thank you. Good idea. Mm-hmm. So it worked well, direct seeded the okra. Wow, okay. On, on the subject of okra too, I should add that I've grown okra in big black pots, the same type that you get trees in, and it's done nicely in there because the black plastic absorbs the heat, so you get a nice warm root zone, and that really helped. Okay. You're putting the crushed eggshells around for the cutworm. Good. Yeah. Uh, so flea beetles, I know for me the flea beetles are troublesome on the arugula. Um, so Well, with flea beetles, some people will put the um, a row cover, uh, one of those thin fabric row covers over top to exclude them. Um, when it comes to something like arugula, I just grow it when the flea beetles won't be as much of a problem. So I'll seed some in a hotbed right about now. And then the arugula, when you seed it in August for a fall crop, it's usually free of flea beetles too. And the, the same market gardener that I spoke about a couple of times during my talk today was telling me that in talking, when he was speaking with market gardeners in Europe, some of them said they had customers who preferred the flea beetle holes in the arugula because I, it gave um, an indication of authenticity or, or not a lot of products used on it. So that they had customers that preferred the holes. I've never met anybody here who, who prefers that, but I thought that was an interesting comment. Wasabi, I've heard of it, I've never tried it. Is it strong? Yeah. Wasabi. Wasabi arugula. Okay. Good. Good. 
Thank you. So I'm going to hang out up front here. If anybody has any questions, feel free to come on up. Thanks for your time. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.